a good conversation the other day about history and religion and all that type of stuff. Um, all that was needed for the coming weeks. Okay. Sometimes it pays to slow down a little bit, get, get that context in. I told you guys before, I'm very history oriented in my approach to literature. So I, I felt it imperative to, to give you all that. I figured too that type of stuff's probably not taught much, British history and all that. So we're more concerned about our American history over, over here. So hopefully you guys got a few, picked up a few new things the other day. But today we're back to the literature. We're talking about Petrarchan sonnets. Petrarchan sonnets. And this is going to be one of the options that you have to pick from whenever you do your own poems here in a couple of weeks. Um, Petrarchan sonnets are a little bit harder than Shakespearean sonnets are. Shakespearean sonnets are what we're going to cover in our next class. Okay, they're a little bit harder than in Shakespearean sonnets to, to, to write. So if you end up do if you end up doing one of these, I will be very impressed. Okay, just because the rhyme scheme and all that's a little bit harder as we as we shall see. But to begin us for today, Petrarch was a poet who was writing uh, I think around let me let me double check here. Maybe my I think my PDF says when he was writing. His his great book was called the Rima Sparse. The Rima Sparse. Yeah, he was li he was living about uh, he lived from thirteen oh four to thirteen seventy four. So um, actually, um, he actually lived before Chaucer, right on the. Uh, on the historical timeline. So that just goes to show you that what we consider medieval in, in England is the Renaissance is already starting to happen over in Italy, right? Because it started a, a couple of hundred years before it did over in England. So, um, but he is one of the great Italian poets. He's known for innovating the sonnet form. And he's also known for almost innovating this Renaissance idea of humanism. Okay, humanism. Key term time, right? Humanism. Humanism's this idea that mankind is the center of God's creation, right? Or the center of God's creation. We're the most important creatures in the universe. Um, everything revolves around us, humans. You know, today there's a, a new philosophy that's come out over the past 50 years or so called post-humanism, right? It's this idea that, well, no, we're not the most important creatures in the universe. We should also pay respect to nature and animals and all this type of stuff too, right? So they, nature, stuff in nature has almost just as many rights as humans do. So, uh, that, of course, stems from the idea of humanism, right? We're the most important creatures in the, in the universe. You guys probably know um, about, it used to be they thought that the earth, uh, that the sun revolved around the earth, right? You guys know all that scientific history. Um, well, you might ask it, the Catholic Church was especially adamant, you know, when Copernicus wrote his book, say and otherwise, like the Catholic Church, he Copernicus actually waited to have that book published until after he was dead, because the Catholic Church uh, was opposed to it. Religious, I'll just ask you guys a random question, religiously speaking, why do you think the Catholic Church would have been opposed to the idea that the sun did not revolve around the earth? Any any guesses here? It, it involves humanism. 
it would have suggested that you know we weren't the greatest creation in all the universe and that we weren't the most important and that if god did create the universe as they believed back then and uh very specifically placed things then it makes us wonder why would he not have us orbiting the sun and or have the sun orbiting us and putting us in that important position exactly right you pretty much you pretty much nailed it right if if the sun does not revolve around the earth right suddenly in the grand scheme of the cosmos we don't seem that important right so this idea of humanism was important religiously speaking as well as secularly as well you know but humanism in general was often used in a secular way too right this idea of the renaissance um, celebrating what is human right this is this is just as secular as it is religious but not to say that religions don't accept parts of it too so uh, petrarch's poems oftentimes take a very similar theme they take a very similar theme um, petrarch subject of his poems was often was this woman named laura laura okay laura was a married woman right so petrarch petrarch fell in love with a married woman right as far as as far as we know he never consummated anything with her right it, so a lot of his ideas that his poetry interrogates is this idea of you know this inaccessible love right you're in love with this woman you're in love with her from afar he's in love with her from afar right he's always hurting himself over and over right just because he knows that he can't consummate it but he's he nonetheless feels drawn to her right he can't imagine himself with any other woman right so he kind of tortures himself over and over and over right so that's pretty much the gist of what a lot of his poems are are about um, let's take let's dive into a couple of them um, I'm, I'm going to sum up what the sonnet form is and stuff but let's just let's just uh let's just dive into a couple of these just so we can kind of see what the content looks like so on the PDF, my favorite one of his collection that I gave you on the PDF is um, poem 141. Take a look at poem 141 on the PDF. I'll pull. I'll just go. Out, I'll go ahead and pull it up. So maybe you guys don't have to dig it out. Um, poem 141. <clears throat> So what we have in this PDF, oops, what we have in this PDF is a translation written in English. And uh, the purpose, hold on, I'm closing all kinds of screens. The purpose of this translation is to capture the whole meaning of the poem, more so than like the poem's form and all this type of stuff. So whenever you translate poetry over in English, you, oftentimes the task of the translator is to do one of those two things, right? Either capture the rhyme and the meter or do your best to capture exactly word for word what the poet meant. So this is written, as you see, this is written in a prose-like form, right? Rather than a, rather than a poem-like form in our translation. Sir Thomas Wyatt, uh, his task was to transform these these poems over into English, but capture the the rhyme and the meter of Petrarch. But this this is my this is my favorite one. So this poem has this idea that. Uh, so keep in mind that this is about his lost love, his inaccessible love, Laura. He says, as sometimes in the summertime, the simple butterfly seeking the light will in its desire fly into someone's eyes, whereby it dies and the other is pained. 
So always I run to my faded son. Her eyes whence such sweetness comes to me, for love cares nothing for the reign of reason, and discernment is vanquished by desire. And I see well how much they shun me, and I know truly that I shall die of it, for my strength cannot hold out against the suffering. But so sweetly does love dazzle me that I bewail another's pain and not my own harm, and my soul blind consents to her own death. Right, so just as uh, a butterfly in its desire, right, for the light almost kills itself, right? So the light of Laura is so bright that he's just like a butterfly that's helpless to fight its instincts, right? And he flies to his own death, right? So that's, that's pretty much the gist of of the poem here right what do, you, what do you guys think of this poem I, i've always dug this one i like it all right why why so can you put your finger on it i can't really like specify it's just, I think it's wor the way that it's worded really draws me to it. And I like the um, use of uh, the butterfly symbolically. All right. I guess we could use a moth too as an example, right? Moths probably go to, moths aren't as romantic as butterflies though. So, right. So, hence we couldn't use moths here. I was going to say some butterflies are prettier than moths. So, it kind of just makes sense that something as beautiful as a butterfly would be used to, um, would be used in this to simplify love, I guess. I agree. And I also think that the use of the butterfly and the simplicity of a butterfly's life and life cycle, they only live for like a week or so. And they're only like, they only have really one purpose, which is just to live. I think that is a really good way to put things and a good use it's, it's very dramatic to say the least right you know this this idea that he's governed by instinct and can't control himself right he wants he wants to let go but he can't right it's very it's very dramatic it's very dramatic right i've always i've always dug this poem just for that reason if nothing else Dale said he thinks he's muted again and he's going to come back. All right. So, um, and the others in this collection, poem 190, I've always, uh, I've always really enjoyed too. We'll see the Sir Thomas Wyatt version of this in a second. It's, it's got a different spin to it, as we will see. But this one says, a white doe and the green grass appeared to me with two golden horns between two rivers in the shade of a laurel when the sun was rising in the unripe season. Her look was so sweet and proud that to follow her I left every task, like the miser who as he seeks treasure sweetens his trouble with delight. Let no one touch me, she bore written with diamonds and topazes around her lovely neck. It has pleased my Caesar make me free and the sun had already turned at midday my eyes were tired by looking but not sated when i fell into the water and she disappeared so we have a few notes here that give you context the doe is often a story used to refer back to greek mythology the story of of diana right you know that i think that i think the diana story is the one where um the voyeur looks at Diana in the woods, right, naked, right, and then she turns him, she turns him into a monster or something after, right, I think that's what that story refers to. The two golden horns, it's like a symbol for her braids and her hair. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
must be some kind of glitch or something where you always have to reboot your computer weirdly. Uh, from here on out, I'm gonna I'll restart it before class. Yeah, we're we're moving on to talking about this poem 190, which is the deer about the deer. It says on the label on the deer says it has pleased my Caesar. No, no one touch me. It has pleased Caesar to make me free. I don't know. What do you get? What do you guys think this poem means? We know that it's got something to do with Laura. I, mean, I think in this one, the use of, you know, the caller saying, don't touch me. It really represented like we want stuff that we can't have. And it say if there's something you just want and you don't know you can't have it, you go after it. Someone tells you, no, you can't have it or you can't do that. You have this desire to do it even more. Right. The yeah, this, uh, this Nicole, I think you you summed it up there, right? You know, this idea that inaccessible things we just want even more, right? It's you tell you tell a kid he can't ha have a candy bar at the grocery store, and right? that's just gonna make the kid scream even louder, right? So, very much a similar sort of sort of idea here. I didn't get to comment on that one before, but I had a thought on that too. Uh. <clears throat> To me, it sounded like he was uh, obviously really in love with her and the pain of him knowing that he couldn't have her, it, it was almost better for her to be dead than alive. I thought that's what he meant to consent to her own death. He was, he, that was a, a happy outcome because it was too much pain to, for her to be alive and him not be able to be with her. So you think it was about her death and not his death? Is that what you're saying here, Dale? I thought that's what it consents to her own death. I, maybe I read that wrong. I, I read it quick. No, I, th I think I think he's I think he's talking about his death here, right? Because it's a, he's kind of setting up his comparison. It's sometimes the summertime, the butterfly seeking the light. When all this desire fly into someone's eyes, so always I run to the sun, right? So the sun being her light here, right? So yeah, I don't, I don't think he would have wished for her death necessarily, right? Yeah, no, I, I, I get what you're saying. I didn't say he was wishing for his death, though. I thought maybe it was a that would have been he would that would have been an okay outcome because it was too painful. I don't know. What about 190? You got any thoughts on this one? The, about the um, doe having the tag on it saying, I'm Caesar's, let no, no one can touch me. No, not right off. All right. Yeah, we'll we'll get back to this one here in just a few minutes when we talk about Wyatt's version. Um, I don't know that any those are the two poems that I usually gravitate to in this collection. Um, that any of the did, I told you guys maybe make a note of a poem that you uh, liked or something like that. Did any of the others in the collection stick out to you here in the Petrarch collection? I like number four as well. I think it's a it's a nice religious poem, but it's also about Laura. He who showed infinite providence and art and his marvelous workmanship, who created this and the other hemisphere and Jove more mild than Mars, who coming to earth to illuminate the pages that for many years had hidden the truth, took John from the nets and Peter and get, even gave them a portion of the kingdom of heaven. He, when he was born, did not bestow himself on Rome, but rather on Judea. So beyond all of the states, it pleased him always to exalt humility. 
Now from a small village he has given us a son, such that nature is thanked in the place where so beautiful a lady was born to the world. All right, so this idea that Christ was humble, right? He was humble. He didn't go preaching his gospel in Rome, right? He did it in Judea. He was a he was from a he was a poor carpenter, right? So just the humility is a thing to be exalted. Um, taking this as the conceit, right? This is the idea. All these sonnets usually have a conceit, right? They usually bounce off of some main idea. They usually set up some idea like this and then put a twist on it, right? So just does Christ exalt, showcase humility, right? Only in God's plan of showing humility, right, could such a, a small place be where this most beautiful of women lives, right? So I've always thought that one's a pretty sweet uh, little poem. <clears throat> so yeah, these are these are just a few examples of, uh, of Petrarch. Any any other ones that you guys noted um, before I move on that um, maybe you want to talk about? There was a couple I liked, but I, I've lost my notes and I can't find the PDF again. Yeah, I think it did. I send that to you. I think I had it on Blackboard. I might be wrong. I can't remember if I blackboarded it or emailed it to you. I can't remember. I feel like there was a couple towards the bottom that I liked, if I remember correctly. One ninety one is a good one too, um, as it is an eternal life to see God, nor can one desire more, nor is it right to desire more. So, lady, seeing you makes me happy in this short and frail life of mine. Nor have I ever seen you as beautiful as you are at this hour. If my eye tells my heart the truth, all sweet hour that makes blessed my thoughts, that surpasses every high hope, every desire. And if it's fleeing, we're not so swift, I would ask no more. For if some light live only on odors, and the fame of it is believed, and some on water or on fire, satisfying their taste and touch with things that lack all sweetness, why should I not live on the life-giving sight of you? All right, so very, very smooth, very smooth here, right? All right, so... I don't know what do you what do you guys think of the content here? Right? Do you like do you maybe maybe some of the ladies in the class can speak up? Right? If somebody wrote you a poem like this, would you would you be wooed or would you think it creepy? Right? What 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 do you think? I like it. If it was like my significant other writing this, I would love it and be very happy. But if it was someone. That I didn't really know, I'd probably be like, oh, thanks, okay. <laughs> yeah, if it was a stranger, I would probably be a little weirded out, but if it was my significant other, I would think that it would be very sweet because it shows like how deep he feels and like his emotions are very apparent. And as far as the content goes, I like it, but I personally am drawn a little bit more to like darker subjects with poetry. Oh, <laughs> you're a romantic poet, right? You're what we were talking about yesterday in our other class. Are you familiar with the movie Troy, Dr. Geiger? Yeah. Okay, uh, in that they have Achilles. He says some very poetic things. He's, uh, he has one where he says, uh, 
And it's it's she's one of the daughters of Troy. I forget who she's a cousin to uh, Orlando Bloom's character. But he said he tells her he says because uh, she's fighting him. He kind of does take her hostage, but he says you'll never be more beautiful than you are now, and we'll never be here again. I love that when he says that. Yeah, I've always enjoyed the the Iliad story, right, which Troy Troy covers. I would. Right. Have you ever seen the uh, the Troy show on Netflix? Yeah, I watched it. I've seen it. They did a really good job covering the Iliad in that in that show. Is that the one where Achilles is African American? Yeah, they did a they did a really good job with that show. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. It was only one season, though, right? Yep, just one season. Have y'all ever read or seen the play? I think it's called The Women of Troy. I don't. I haven't seen that. It is wonderful. Uh, I worked. I tried really hard to get my junior theater teacher to produce it, but they just weren't having it. Who was it? Who was it? Benny. No, I'd say he probably would have liked it. That was when I was in school in Virginia. All right, so um, let's let's now uh, transition over into talking about form of poems, of these poems. So this is where things start getting a little complicated. Um, these sonnet forms are very mathematical, right? Everything is very mathematical within within a sonnet. Okay, so I'll go back to the PDF in a second just so you can see what this looks like in in the original italian i can't read the original italian but we'll be able to make sense of it of a little bit of it based off of uh the rules of science that i'm getting ready to cover i don't know if this will work let me pull up a word document So whenever we're talking about a sonnet, English poetry, especially sonnets, has a lot of rules that you have to cover. Whenever you write your own in the coming weeks, maybe you won't do a sonnet. Maybe you'll do the alliterative poem like Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, right? That's an option too. But if you write a sonnet, you kind of have to follow these rules um, of the form. So in a Petrarchan sonnet, the, one of the rules that we have to, to cover is rhyme. Uh, it is rhyme. This isn't usually whenever you think about rhyme, you think line, rhyme, lines rhyme back and forth of each other. They're cut. Lots of times when you think about rhyme, you think of couplets. So the first, second, the first and second line rhyme, the third and fourth line rhyme, right? Sonnets don't work that way. Um, well, actually, I'll just show you the uh, prompt for the imitation exercise. We'll cover it. So whenever we have so in this first example the petrarchan sonnet which we're covering today you the rhyme works in a very intricate way so when we have these letters signify so the letters all the letters do is signify like one type of rhyme so whatever your your a letter is that's your a sound Right, that's your first sound that you're repeating several times. So is the B, the B sound. This, this is the B sound that you repeat several times. And then you have a C sound, a D sound, and an E sound. So these are five different 
rhyme sounds that you have to have within your lines. A sonnet always has 14 lines, no more, no less. You always have 14 lines. And in the Petrarchan scheme, it rhymes in this way. So it rhymes A. So this is this is something to make a note of. Okay. It rhymes A B B A, A B B A, C D D C E E. So your first line has a certain sound, and the rhyme for that sound comes in the fourth line. Right? Your B sound has a certain sound. Those sounds rhyme back to back. Um, so you repeat the same sound in your first eight lines, your first, the same two sounds in your first eight lines. And then uh, you have your C, D, and E sounds to close it out. So this, the, in your final six lines, the first C rhymes with the fourth line in the final six lines. The two D sounds rhyme back to back. And the two E sounds rhyme back to back. All right, so very reason why I say a Petrarchan sonnet is harder than an English sonnet, which we're going to cover in next time, is because the rhyme scheme is so much harder. Right, this is a pretty hard rhyme scheme to match. Right, you have your first line, and then the when it rhymes is in the fourth line. Right, that, that's a that's a bit of a difficult one to do. So 14 lines, right? It has this rhyme scheme. So basically the way that these work, the first eight lines is called, the literary term for it is called the octave. The octave, O-C-T-A-V-E, the octave. So the octave is when you set up, is when the poet sets up the problem in the sonnet, right? So we have, we have that like in the one example, just as the simple butterfly, right? Fly, flies to the light because it has its desires, right? It flies to the light seeking its death, right? That's pretty much what the octave was in that particular sonnet, right? The first eight lines, this is where you set up the problem. The comparison, usually a sonnet, elaborately compare something to someone at something else All right so this is where you set up your comparison is in this octave the final six lines are called the sestet the sestet and that's spelled s-e-s-t-e-t -E -E the sestet and that's when usually in the sestet that's when there's some type of turn in the sonnet so just as the butterfly seeking its light at the end of its life. So I, right, am in love with Laura, right? Seek out my own death, flying into the light, right? So there's always, usually when that ninth line begins, there's always a turn in the sonnet. So first eight lines set, set up the comparison. The final six lines give the resolution. All right, so that's how that's how these work. And they always follow this rhyme scheme, right? A B B A, A B B A. So let me um, go back to the Italian then. And I will show you. This will be much easier to see when we look at the Wyatt versions in English. <clears throat> so like like let's let's take for 141 for instance. So we don't know what the well you can guess what some of these words mean like sole right the the sun the sun right that soul the sun. And we have sole dole aveza vegeza so sole is our a sound right dole and we have sole and vole right that's that's the next in the next part, that's the A sound being repeated. We have our B sound, Aveza, Vegeza, Dulcesa, Presa. 
and we have our C sound. Um, this one might, there's two different ways to rhyme a pentroican sonnet. Let me see how this one works. Yeah, the, the way that I the way that I showed you works. There's another way to do it too, where it's C D um, C D E E. So he did it both both ways. So we have our C sound, Anyo, Afonio, right? That's our C sound. Vera Semente, So Wamente, Danyo. Contente. Right, so we see we see these how these sounds work. Um, one ninety one ninety follows the pattern that I gave you just now, but better. Um, when we get to our C sounds, we have the intorneo. Then our next C sound is four lines down. Gornio, Topazi, Parway, Saucy, Sparway. Notice how, notice how uh, in Italian, whenever we have a V, I, I sound it out like it's a W, right? That's how Italian works. You know, these are romantic languages. Uh, w was not part of the alphabet for the longest time. So whenever there's a W sound, it would be spelled with a V. So just a fun little fun little fact for you. Take a look at uh, the, the text now. Look at 667 in the text. 667. Now we're going to talk now we're going to see how this works in English with uh, Sir Thomas Wyatt. 667. Actually, 668. Let's look at this poem, Whoso List the Hunt. Whoso List the Hunt, because this is the English version of the one that we just read. Now, on 668, Whoso List the Hunt, let's look at the rhyme. Before we even read the poem, let's look at the rhymes at the end of the line so you can see the pattern. So we have our A sound, hind, behind, mind. Then, then it's wind, but you would pronounce it wind, right? Just, just because you're keeping the sound pattern going. More, sore, before, therefore. That's your B sound, right? So that's your first eight lines. Then we have our C sound, doubt, about, vain, plain. So, so the C sound was, was doubt and about. The D sound is vain and plain. And then we have our final rhyming couplet, which is our E sound. So tain, am and tain. So um, again, you can, you can kind of see the pattern that he's that he's following here to close it out. But um, as far as the content of the Sir Thomas Wyatt poems go, um, just to introduce you guys a little bit to Sir Thomas Wyatt, who he was. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to cover history the other day was give you some context for who some of these poets were. Sir Thomas Wyatt was one of the first uh, English sonnet writers. Uh, he, he was a generation or two before Shakespeare. He, uh, he lived, he was part of the court of King Henry VIII. King Henry VIII, right? as, we, we, as we know, King Henry VIII was nuts, right? He was crazy. But uh, Within the court of Sir of King Henry VIII, it was rumored that Sir Thomas Wyatt was having an affair with Anne Boleyn, who is one of King, who is one of Henry VIII's wives. Right, so 
let's read this poem now and think about that, right? We have this idea of the Petrarchan um, inaccessible lover, right? So uh, let's, let's see what kind of added edge this poem has knowing that he and Anne Boleyn had a thing together. So whoso lists the hunt, I know where is a hind. But as for me, um, alas, I may no more. The vain travail hath wearied me so sore. I am of them that further cometh behind, yet may I by no means my wearied mind draw from the deer. But as she fleeth afore, feigning I follow. I leave off therefore, since in a net I seek to hold the, the wine. Who lists her hunt, I put him out of doubt, as well as I may spend his time in vain. Engraven with diamonds and letters plain, there is written her fair neck round about. Nali me tegere, for Caesar's I am, and wild for to hold, though I seem tame. And as we uh, see the footnote says, that's Latin for touch me not. So, uh, knowing what I just told you about Wyatt and Anne Boleyn, right? If we're going to put Anne Boleyn as the deer here, right? What, what does, what, how does the poem's meaning slightly change in tone, do you think, with that context I just gave you? Well, he says uh, Caesar's I am, which is basically saying that she's the king's. And then he talks about trying to, to hold the wind with the net, which we know that's uh, an exercise of futility. Right. Yeah, that the Caesar's I am, right? That, that sums it up, right? She belongs to the king, Caesar. Knowing how crazy Henry VIII is, Right, that kind of even adds an, another extra, extra layer of fear to it. Right, don't go near this. You really want this deer, right? She's very beautiful, but don't go near. Right, you might lose your head. Right? That's kind of it kind of has that uh, extra, extra edge to it here as well. Um, Was these published? Uh, did, did these come out right during all that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Have these been interpreted very much during that time? Of being like, wow, I wonder what he's talking about. <laughs> Sir Thomas Wyatt um, was actually put in prison for this for a long time. Yeah. Now his audience would have been very aware of what he meant. What he meant. Right. So he he was put in prison for his uh, alleged affair. Um, I don't know if it was ever so blatant as they called them in bed together or whatever, right? But, but it, it was very well known that those two had a uh, had a thing. Um, kind of wild that he only got put in prison when you know it, it's argued that he killed some of his wives. Why was he given like lenience almost? That's a good question. Um, let's see. The book says um, why it was an ambassador. It says that he gained Henry's will, goodwill at the end of his life again. Um, so I, th I think it was because he was an ambassador and did a lot of good ambassador work and stuff. So Henry kind of let his jealousies go and uh, let him go back into, into service. Wyatt died at the age of 39. Um, he didn't live a very long life, as, as many didn't in those days. So yeah, interesting interesting spin on uh, on that 190 poem from Rima Sparse. Whereas in the Petrarch, it's a little sweeter, right? This one's got more of a foreboding type of 
type of atmosphere to it. I like this one too, My Galley on the next page, My Galley. So again, in the octave, we're setting up the comparison. So he's talking about the comparison he's using to describe his love and whatever is this galley, this boat. He says, my galley charged with forgetfulness through sharp seas and winter nights doth pass between rock and rock and ache mine enemy, alas, that is my Lord steereth with cruelness. And every oar of thought and readiness, as though that death were light in such a case, an endless wind doth tear the sail apace. A forced sighs and trusty, trusty fearfulness, a rain of tears, a cloud of dark disdain, hath done the wearied cords great hindrance, wreathed with error and ache with ignorance. The stars be head that led me to this pain, be hid that led me to this pain, drown in his reason. That should me comfort, and I remain despairing of the port. So lost at sea, right? His emotion, his emotional state is so is so kind of all over the place that he this comparison is he's he's lost at sea um, in a storm. So that's kind of what that poem is is going for a little bit. Um, we don't get the Petrarchan version of, of that, unfortunately. So again, we see a rhyme scheme, forgetfulness, coolness, past, alas, uh, readiness, fearfulness, case of pace. Um, and we have disdain, pain, hindrance, ignorance, comfort, port. Yeah, this all the stuff is different, right? This this is this is different. Um, like I said, we have these subjects. Um, like I said, like I just showed you, this is very mathematical stuff. I haven't even talked about meter yet, like the the sound the sound of each line, like the rhythm of the sound each line takes. I'm gonna work. I'll do that more next class when we talk about Shakespeare to talk about meter like each line has its own meter too like the thumb the thumb the thumb it has a it has a rhythm to it but I'm not going to talk about that with Wyatt just because his meter is a little more irregular compared to Shakespeare's um, we'll cover that more next class when we talk about Shakespeare's sonnets what is the uh the four stanza uh 16 line poem is that traditional um this this here i'm having a hard time like piecing it together how it works exactly the son the sonnet's the most and whenever we talk about english poetry at least the sonnet's the most traditional form um for like i said like i said the 14 lines like every other line rhymes pretty much um yeah, so this, like I said, the first eight lines set up the problem in the poem. Like the final six lines usually give some type of resolution in the poem. I meant more so the the rhyming in in these here that we're going over now. So the sixteen line poem. How's how does the rhyme work in in those? Do you remember? Is it every line rhymes back to back, or is it um, no like uh. Yeah, it does. It ever, ever, ever. The first line goes with the next line. Uh, I like William Ernest Henley. Uh, a lot of his are like I was just talking about. Right. Yeah, as, as the centuries progressed, um, a lot of these writers would eventually break out of these types of types of forms and innovate new forms as, uh, as time passed. Sometimes they would still go back and write sonnets, though. Um, like, a, you would probably run into more of that type of stuff if you took Brit Lit 2, the Brit Lit 2 course. That would be where you would run into 
more variants of of this. This is the OG, I guess you could you could say the classical sonnet. Um, American, if we take an American class, an American lit, um, American poetry is radically different. Um, radically different. Americans don't follow, American poetry typically doesn't follow these rules. Um, like Walt Whitman, Walt Whitman's poems does not follow these rules. He doesn't do these rhymes. It's more of a poetry based on rhythm. Um, yeah, he his argument was, hell, we're Americans. We should break free from these from these Brits, right? Why should we listen to them? Right? We're 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 Americans. We're a lot cooler, right? Why should we listen to these stuffy Brits about how we should write our poetry? Right? So, uh, not to say that all American poets don't rhyme, but typically, uh, typically Americans forego rhyme. Right? Okay mostly because of Whitman's influence. Of course, there's some poets too, like Robert Frost. Robert Frost said that uh, unrhymed poetry is like playing tennis with the net down. Right, so, right. Is it really poetry if it's not that hard to write? Right. I, 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 that's I, a cool I, analogy. I like that. I like stuff that that's cool. It's very snarky. I, I love it. Personally, even though I'm an American lit scholar, I prefer the British stuff. Like, I just typically do, just because I think I really appreciate how hard this stuff was to write. Whenever you guys write your own in a week or two, um, I think you'll get some appreciation of it too, just because it is very hard to write. Write these things. Yeah, that's what I was. I meant by this. I hope you didn't take that the wrong way. When I I think this right here is I, I can appreciate it tremendously because it looks really tough to write. Like, you know, I've dabbled in what I consider traditional, the what I was talking about, the, the 16 line four stanzas. This here, though, man, it looks tough. Yeah, so I'm going to show you guys plenty of uh, student examples and stuff that people have written for me in the past and the come, next few couple of classes. So, so you'll even see. Uh, some modern, more modern types of poems with modern wording and diction and stuff, but that still follows these rules. So you will, I will give you guys plenty of examples. Um, yeah, poetry, po unrhymed poetry is playing tennis with the net down. I know I've always, I've always Who'd you say said that? Frost. Yeah, Robert Frost is the guy who wrote the poem about the road less traveled and all that all that stuff. I don't know. What's, what's your guys' reading experience like with this stuff today? Did you find it hard? Did uh, finding it hard, did, did that uh, did that maybe shut you down a bit? Like, what, What's your reading experience with these poems? Did you find... Did you not find it as enjoyable as some of the last previous stuff we've read? Um, I know sometimes this type of poetry scares the hell out of students, right? Uh, what was your experience reading them before class today? I did not like any of them. I thought they were all interesting and I enjoyed all of them. Uh, when I first looked at it, I was confused. So I was like, the content for these is so similar that I, that I realized what was going on and I was like oh put together the themes pretty quick yeah I love trying to perceive what I'm reading in poetry that's why I like it so much I, I, I like the style and the flavor of it it's just what I was trying it, the thoughts of trying to write one of these in this style seems daunting the Shakespeare version of this was a little easier. Um, I think we'll see you next class when we talk about those. His rhymes are a little easier to do uh, than this. Um, but maybe maybe once you read some examples that other students have written, uh, maybe, maybe it won't seem so bad. I love trying to perceive poetry, though. Like anybody in here that's had 102, like Maya Angelou and uh, a couple of the other, like I, 
I, lo I love that stuff. But this here is just completely different than that. Who did you have for one of the two? Uh, Lisa Evans, Miss Evans. Yeah, she's she's more of a British lip person, so uh, an American, I know. So, but I like I said, traditional. Typically, I don't like a lot of modern poetry. I, I, I dig this old stuff more. That's just it's just my own taste, I suppose. But if you had to choose the write in one, which would you find easier? Definitely the newer stuff. I've written I've written a few sonnets and sonnets and it's not easy to do as as you guys will will see. Yeah, I, the Green Knight you was talking about it, is that called an alliterative poem? I thought that was super neat after I realized what you was talking about them them repeating consonants. Then you have your little rhyme part at the end, the bob and wheel or. Would you, sorry, would you say that sonnets are more like passionate than modern poems? Yeah, they they typically have this love theme and stuff, right? Like Nicole said, um, she likes the edgy stuff, right? Oftentimes these sonnets aren't too edgy in this regard. Um, yeah, so. Um, but they can be too, as we'll see. Like, there's lots of spins that we that you could put on a sonnet. Shakespeare definitely, as we'll see when we talk about Shakespeare and on on, uh, Tuesday, on Monday of next week, um, he makes fun of a Petrarchan sonnet in one of his sonnets, which is really fun. Yeah, but they don't have to always be about love, right? They can be about other subjects too. But typically, you know, they're about rom romance and things like this. Um, you know, later, later, when other types of subjects became more popular, um, we saw we start seeing different forms emerge and whatnot. You can write whenever you write your own sonnet; it doesn't have to be about love. Right? You can write it about anything. I've had people write sonnets about Batman and all kinds of shit for me before, right? So, right. I have I have one example I will show you. Let me see if I can find it. Let me see if I can find it really quick. I know I can. Give me just a second. On one of my old blackboard shells. And this is one of my fa all time favorite uh, student examples that someone you did for me before. Um, it's pretty raunchy, so, so brace yourself. Um, whoso list to drink, okay? Whoso list to drink, I know where is a keg. But as for me, oh fuck, I will no more. I started too soon to get up fra this floor. Awake, he yells, the beer is green, move leg. The he roommate Greg says, Miss Beer and Egg, thou shalt see what I mean. Say I never more. To act with spins is warned against in folklore. Little else I remember for the laughing of Greg. More than an hour did seem to pass when I rose up to find some strewn clothes and alas, with hair of Irish black, she lent to kiss. The sight of started foolish dream for I sees not a girl, but dog I kiss. I'll kick Greg's ass for this. No one aways with taking the piss. All right, so a pretty, pretty funny little uh, 
little spin. Right. We we of course read the Whoso List the Hunt, right? So he did his own little little spin on a drunken a drunken day where he was so drunk he kissed the dog, thinking that it was uh thinking that it was a lass with Irish black hair. And little it's a little fun one here. He follows the scheme, right? Keg, leg, more floor, egg, Greg. Nevermore folklore. I, he literally does. He gets kind of lazy at this rhyme. I am I, right? Um, last kit, last ass, kiss, piss, right? So you can kind of see how how he does it. What are you calling a slant rhyme in your notations up there? So a slant, a slant rhyme is a rhyme that's not exact with spelling. So it's a rhyme that sounds like, that sounds like a rhyme, but the spelling isn't quite, um, it doesn't rhyme quite with spelling. So like I, I and I, right? It's the same, it's the same sound, but it doesn't rhyme with uh with the way that it's spelled so that's what a slant rhyme is traditionally these sonnets did, did not have slant rhymes they had very exact rhymes um, this device where you see uh, We'll talk more about this next time when we talk about meter. I mean, like the way that he has worn in the line with the apostrophe, breaking it up. That's a way that you can keep your meter on track. So like, let's say you have a, a, a word that's a couple of syllables. Well, that's a way you can cut a syllable out of a line to keep the rhyme going, to keep the meter going. That's what that's what if you wondered what set um, worn. Yeah, that that's what that's for. It's it's for keeping syllables, syllable count down. So that's what yeah, that's exactly what that is for. Let's see if I have another example here. I can pull up. Yeah, here's another Petrarch and one I have. As you guys see, my as far as content goes, I do not give a crap what you write about. So, uh, every I like to think that my classroom is both PG and R. Okay, so it's PG when we're in here, but it's R when, whenever it comes to what you can do. I like how that was good enough to show us, but yet he still got an A minus. That's scary. <laughs> This one's a this one was a full A if I, if I recall. Now what am I to do when girls don't call, and I have little money in my purse, but the wonder so this this was when I taught at Ohio U in Athens Ohio. But to wander over to Athens Curse, a pub referred to as the Smiling Skull, inexpensive beer and cheaper ladies plagued that establishment to my delight. Those gaps, so he's making a wife, a wife of bath reference here. Those gaps tooth women prowl day and night who make me question some more Guinness. To some, it seems a simple answer back that one should go and never dare return, while some profess I have a gift and knack of bringing forth the uncouth to my shack. My drunkenness has yet to make me learn the possible outcomes of when I churn. Right, so. Got a guy going hunting for the lady for the cheap gaps tooth ladies at the bar, right? That's that's pretty much what this one is about. As I said, a fine poem that only meets the prosody in the correct rhyme scheme, but also is a rather entertaining piece. Right? So good work. 
his rhymes here call skull purse curse ladies again sees the light might back knack return learn churn so yeah hope hopefully reading a couple of those gave you some uh, some insight that yeah you can write in a modern voice but still use these rules okay hopefully hopefully doing those did that I have more examples. I just kind of got to read through my archives and dig a few up from previous classes and stuff. So I'll do, I'm going to do that in the next couple of days too, get you some more examples that you can use. I'd like to have a little bit more clarity, like in a, a written form of the rules too, maybe. Right. Yeah, I'll, I will do that. I will do that. Whenever I give you the prompt for your all your options, all of that's written on there. The Petrarchan's a little weird because there's two ways you can rhyme it. Um, yeah, the, the C and D and E sounds. There's two ways you can rhyme rhyme the final six lines. So, that's, so if that was a little confusing for some of you guys, that's why there's two ways you can do it. Um, the Shakespeare one's a lot easier, as we will see next time. Yeah, you think about Shakespeare, you think, damn, Shakespeare's not easy to read. What are you talking about? Well, compared to the Petrarchan ones, he is, as, you, as we'll see. So our textbook for the Shakespeare sonnets, um, there's, a, there's quite a few of them in here. Um, yeah, just skim through them all read them all that's in there it's about 10 pages or so of sonnets for next time but the ones in particular that i will be talking about very uh, carefully if you want to make a note of eight sonnet 18 is one of the ones i'll talk about that's one of his most famous ones shall i compare thee to a summer's day Thou art more lovely and more temperate than the darling buds of May. And I, I'll talk about that one. Um, 130 is also one that I like to always talk about. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. All right. That's Do you have the page number of any of these? Yeah, in the, in the text, the Shakespeare sonnet starts on 1203. 1203. They go from about 1203 to 1214 or so. Um, but you get, they give you about 10 or 15 different sonnets to read. He wrote 180 of them um, in his collection, but you guys will get the, mo the most famous ones of the lot. But especially, so they're numbered and from one to 180. But 18 and 130 are definitely ones that I will that we'll talk about very carefully in class. Um, so just to prep you for next time. And then after that, um, we'll be moving on to drama, some early drama before a midterm start, before a midterm. So final thoughts on some of this stuff. Some of you guys didn't talk today that normally do. Um, Kara, Leah, Hannah, you guys have any thoughts on uh, these sonnets and your reading experience before we close class out? I thought it was interesting how each sonnet began with the title like the first sentence, what like repeated the title. I thought that was cool. Yeah, that that is that is pretty neat. So whenever you guys do your own, right? That's a, that's a convention that you can probably that you can probably do. Knowing your first line is important in that way. Um, sometimes the the writers don't do that on purpose. Like whenever you read the Shakespeare ones, um, like I don't think he named the sonnets. Like he, 
sometimes the editors just put put a name in for it, like 18 in my mistress's eyes or nothing like the sun. Right? And yeah, very, very nice observation there, Kelsey. Right? Oftentimes they do use that first line to name it. Anything else? Like, like I said, I think I think you guys will gravitate more to the to the Shakespeare stuff. It's it's really good stuff. Um, take your time with them, right? Maybe just read a couple at a time, even right. Sometimes when you try to binge read these things, right? Sometimes sometimes your mind maybe skirts over them. Maybe just read a couple at a time here and there. I think that's a good strategy for appreciating them. Um, so without further ado, we'll see you guys next time. And also remember your paper's coming up. So next time, next Monday, your paper's due. All right, so remember, remember that too.